Well, welcome. My name's Keith Lowry. If you haven't met me, I'm the B team. Um, Jeff is out, Rodney's out, Travis is out, Stephen is out. This week, Jack Martin and, uh, uh, let's see, Kelly Hamilton and I are leading staff meeting, so <laughs> I I'm bringing the ice, so we're going we're gonna to have a good time. Um, today, we are going to continue in this series uh, in Hebrews with a sermon entitled, A Better Confidence. Since the 1st of June, we've been in the, the Better Sermon Series. Don't tell Jeff I said that, but we've been in this Better Sermon Series where we've looked at a better guide, a better leader, a better promise, and, and several others. And today, we're going to uh, continue that with this series uh, with A Better Confidence. And this is from Hebrews 9 and 10. You know, I am and always have been a fairly confident person, I would say, but I am not Tom Cruise confident. Uh, Susanna and I recently saw the, the latest Mission Impossible movie. It's called uh, Dead Reckoning Part 1. It just came out. We went to see it last weekend. And Tom Cruise, who is almost my age, I'm sure you know this, does all his own stunts. Now look, I do all my own stunts. It's just never intentional in my case. But in this and all of his movies, listen, he runs. I mean, he runs. Have you ever seen one of his movies? He's always running. He's in a hurry everywhere he goes. But can I tell you something about myself? I don't run. Like, ever. If you ever see me running, go ahead and call the ambulance because I'm fixing to need it. Either because what is chasing me caught me or because I was running. I don't, I don't run. And he also, look, look by, by the way, spoiler alert, I'm about to tell you a couple of things about this movie, uh, but I won't spoil the ending for you. He wins. <laughs> Oops. Um, but in this movie, Cruz engages in the most unbelievable car chase you can imagine. Literally ridiculous car chase. He has a long, drawn-out fight on the top of a moving train. And then, just to top it off, he drives a motorcycle off a cliff over a chasm, drops the bike, pulls his parachute, rides the parachute to catch up to the moving train where he crashes through the window of the dining car and starts another fight. This guy is very combative. Look, I'm, I'm confident, but I'm not Tom Cruise confident. The character he plays, Ethan Hunt, has to be almost a superhero because the missions they send him on truly are impossible missions. And it takes someone with supernatural abilities to accomplish an impossible mission. Well, today we're going to be reminded of an impossible mission that a supernatural friend of ours has accomplished and the value that that brings to our lives as we look at a better confidence. We're going to see... In several passages from Hebrews 9 and 10, what Christ has done to provide a way for us to have fellowship with the Father and to be adopted into God's family. So first we're going to look at mission impossible. We're going to look at the old covenant and why it was never intended to provide forgiveness of sin. And then we're going to look at mission possible and we'll see what Jesus has made possible by his perfect sacrifice. And then we'll finally we'll conclude with mission accomplished. Listen. Everything that was necessary to make us God's children is finished. It's done. There's nothing else for us to do to qualify to be fully adopted into God's family. So as we get started, if you'll open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9, I'm going to begin with uh, reading verse 1, which says, That first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. In our uh, dwell reading plan, if you're following along with that, you know that we've been reading uh, these last few weeks in Hebrews and in Exodus. And in fact, it was in Exodus just this, this last week and the first part of this week that we've seen the exhaustive instructions for building the tabernacle, the altar, the lampstands, for the priest's clothing. Did you read that part in chapter 30, I think it was, of Exodus about the priest's clothing? All the items and the stones and the gold. I, he must have had 40 pounds of clothes on. I cannot imagine how long it took his valets to get him ready every morning. And you know, if it was me, they'd get me all ready and then I'd have to go to the bathroom. I mean, it's just ridiculous, all of the things that they had to do to be prepared 
uh, to worship in that tabernacle. There were rules and regulations for consecrating the priest, consecrating the altar and the tabernacle and how to build all the furniture and implements. This is a list of very exacting specifications for a tabernacle that they were to build in the wilderness and then move every time they moved. Probably 39 or 40 different times they moved and had to pack all that up and take it and set it back up again. Don't you know after 15 or 20 moves, they're like, just pitch it over there, it'll be fine. It was almost impossible to follow all of these rules and regulations. Those regulations for daily and yearly sacrifices were so stringent it was truly next to impossible. And it didn't work. Look down the page a little bit at verses 9 and 10. This is an illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. For that old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were in effect only until a better sacrifice, a better system could be established. The impossible mission in the Old Covenant was securing forgiveness of sin with animal sacrifices. All the laws and regulations for daily and yearly sacrifices only served as a reminder of sin. And that's important to remember later in this message. We'll look at that. Listen, don't be led into the false belief that by your own efforts you can secure your salvation. The mission to gain our redemption through our own efforts is truly an impossible mission. It has failed. Thankfully, the Lord didn't leave us hanging because what was impossible in the Old Covenant, Jesus has made possible by ushering in the New Covenant. Let's look together at verses 11 and 12 in chapter 9. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He's entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Verse 12 says, with his own blood, which was a more perfect sacrifice, not through the blood of goats and calves. You see, the, the goats were sacrificed for the people's sin and the calves were sacrificed for the high priest's sin. Tell Jeff sometime that you've heard that it takes a larger sacrifice to cover the preacher's sin. Just tell him that. The sacrificial system of the Old Testament was God's gracious provision of allowing as a foreshadowing of Christ's death an unblemished animal to pay the death penalty for human sin, but it only pointed us to our need for a Savior. These verses also say that Jesus did this once for all time, a phrase you'll hear often today in this message, which emphasizes Christ's complete and finished Sacrifice, Salvation and forgiveness and redemption are complete and forever accomplished. And then we read in verses 13 through 15 about Jesus establishing the new covenant. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship, that's elsewhere translated serve, so that we can serve the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That's why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people. So that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of sins they had committed under that first covenant. Uh, the message translation of verse 14 sounds like this. It was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. By that single offering, he did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying process. Christ, who is our perfect sacrifice, is the perfect spotless 
Lamb of God. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life you inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or spot. And he purifies us so that we can serve the living God. Believers are literally saved to serve. Romans 6, 12 through 14 says, don't let sin control the way you live. Don't give in to sinful desires. Don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God for you were dead, but now you have new life. Sin is no longer your master for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Listen, salvation is freedom from the tyranny of sin to the lordship of God. Salvation is not a product, a pre-purchased ticket to heaven or a fire insurance policy, but it's a relationship of faith, of obedience and service. All believers, all believers are gifted for ministry and service to the body of Christ. We are quite literally Saved to serve. And Christ's sacrifice has accomplished now, once for all time, complete forgiveness. Look at verse 28. Chapter 9, verse 28. So also, Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He'll come again, not to deal with sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for Him. So here's what Christ has made possible by His new covenant secured by His sacrifice. Our access to God is now assured. Because of what Christ did, we, have now, we now have direct access into the most holy place, into the very presence of the Father. He provided for forgiveness of sin once for all time because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. His perfect sacrifice secured our redemption forever. He paved the way for our consciences to be purified and He made it possible for us to be set free from the penalty of sins we've committed. What was impossible in the first covenant, Christ has made possible once for all time by His own death and resurrection. And having done this, Jesus' redemptive work was now complete. Remember in John 19, verse 30, after the soldiers had lifted up a sponge soaked in sour wine for Jesus who was on the cross, he uttered this phrase, it is finished. Found only in the Gospel of John, the Greek word translated, it is finished, is tetelestai. It's an accounting term that means paid in full. When Jesus uttered those words, he was declaring the debt that we owed to his father was wiped away completely and forever. We have been redeemed. And now look with me at uh, chapter 10 in Romans verses 1 through 4. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing for those who came to worship, I mean, if they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead... Those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. The old system wasn't able to provide forgiveness of sin. It was a daily and annual reminder of sin, but could not take away sin. Look at verses 9 and 10. Then he, Jesus, then he said, Look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. So Christ establishes the new covenant in his blood once 
for all time. Everything that needed to be done to secure our salvation has been accomplished. And all we must do at this point is respond to God's offer through faith in the finished work of Christ. Mission accomplished. And here's how we know he has finished the work the Father sent him to do. Look with me at verses 11 and 12, and then we'll also read 14. Under the old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But our high priest offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time, and then he sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. For by that one offering, he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. A single sacrifice for sins, good for all time, and then he sits down at God's right hand. The priests in the Old Covenant had to offer, stand at the altar and offer sacrifices day after day, again and again, the same sacrifices because they never took away sin. Jesus offered himself to God as a single, a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. And then he sat down at the right hand of the Father. He sat down because his redemptive work is done for all time. And then in verse 14, we see this tension that's present all throughout the book of Hebrews in the area of uh, the security of the believer. It says he forever made perfect those who are being made holy. See, Jesus once for all time sacrifices permanently perfected us who believe. Now, however, believers must continue in their faith and repentant response, which is the process of sanctification or being made holy. And now I want to show you something. This is incredible. What the Lord does to institute a new way of drawing us to himself. Verses 15 through 18. And the Holy Spirit also testifies that this is so. For he says, this is the new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven... There is no need to offer any more sacrifices. That old sacrificial system has been set aside because the daily and annual reminder of sins is no longer needed. Now, he has literally written his law on our hearts. Whose hearts? The passage says, the hearts of his people. Our consciences now serve to remind us of sin so there was no longer any need to offer sacrifices to be reminded of sins. He does this in the hearts of his people. That's a key reminder. And having been reminded of our sins, now look what we can do in verses 19 through 23. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by that new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. When you see therefore in scripture, I'm sure you know this. You have to ask, what is the therefore, therefore? In this case, the therefore refers back to the assurance that by Christ's perfect sacrifice, once for all, we have been redeemed. Because of his finished work, therefore, we have confidence to approach the living God. So draw near to God. Hold fast to your confession because he who promised is faithful. Don't let the deceiver convince you that God's going to be so displeased with you because of sin that you are not welcome in his presence. The sin has been redeemed. The sin is gone. It's washed away once for all time, opening up a way for you, you to be in the presence of God. So draw near to God. It's done. We are in his presence with confidence. You know, uh, in the old uh, system, the high priest is the only one who would enter the Holy of Holies. And it was, they were so convinced 
that that was a dangerous place to be. Nobody else would go in there ever. And when there's a tradition, I'm not sure how accurate it is, but there's a tradition that when the high priest did enter, they would tie a rope around his ankle as he entered the Holy of Holies in case he died because we ain't going in there. They'll drag him out if they have to, but nobody would go in there because that was a dangerous place to be in the very presence of a holy God. And yet what Christ has done for us is secure. He has ripped the veil. He has secured our direct access to the holy and living God because of what he has done. And he sat down at God's right hand. It's done. It's finished. Jesus has provided once for all the perfect sacrifice. And our confidence is in Him, not in our abilities. It's only in Him. He accomplished with His one sacrifice what the old system never could. Once for all time, He provided cleansing and forgiveness for those who believe. Listen, human effort cannot bring salvation or assurance. However, a changed and a changing life of faith is evidence that one truly has been redeemed. The normal result of being in the presence of a holy God is a life of service to God. Let us draw near and hold fast with confidence as we serve the living God because it is finished. Look, I told you earlier, I'm a fairly confident person. Apparently from a young age, I have been a confident person. I proved that to anybody who was paying attention, but my confidence was and is sometimes, let's say, misplaced. My mother tells me that when when I was five, we lived in Tampa, Florida. We were always going to the beach and we were always at a pool somewhere um, in Tampa. And so mom took me at the age of five to get swimming lessons. So she took us to the community pool, stood all the five-year-olds up on the side of the pool. The teacher was in the water and began to tell all these little five-year-olds, today I'm going to begin teaching you how to swim. At which point my mother says, I piped up and said, I already know how to swim. I don't need lessons and stepped off into the water and sank like a rock. Uh, she didn't miss a beat. She picked me up soaking wet, put me on the side, and continued to then teach us how to swim. At the age of 10, uh, my grandfather, uh, John Milton Lowry, Pop, uh, owned a Conoco distributorship in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, with his uh, friend and business partner, Forrest Love. And I loved hanging out with Forrest because Forrest, in addition to running the oil company with my granddad, Forrest had a horse farm outside of town. So I spent lots of time with Forrest out there hanging out at the barn, riding horses. It was absolutely marvelous place to be. One day, Forrest and I were working in the barn. By the way, if you if you ever meet any other member of my family, don't tell them this. Nobody else knows. Um, Forrest said, "Hey, Keith, I'm ten. He says, "Hey, Keith, do you know how to drive?" Sure. I mean, I'm ten. I've seen people drive. Of course, I know how to drive. He said, "Well, go down to the house and get my truck." bring it up here to the barn. We need to load up some of this stuff. So, great. So I went down to the house, got in his great big old Dooley farm truck and proceeded to drive it back to, I couldn't even, I couldn't sit and reach the pedals. I'm 10. I was probably this, I didn't get this massive growth spurt until I was in seventh grade. So at, at 10, I'm standing to drive the truck. Luckily, it was an automatic. Well, he had a, to get into the, the place where the barn was. He had to go through a cattle guard gate And apparently that truck was wider than the gate because I left all of the trim on the right side of his truck on the gate. Um, I don't think I ever told Forrest that, but I'm sure that Forrest is now confident that he shouldn't let 10-year-olds drive his truck. (laughs) So, Look, sadly, there are many other examples I could give you. But while my confidence in my own capabilities does not always lead to the best results, I have supreme confidence in Christ as the mediator of the new covenant that has secured my redemption completely once for all time and in the fact that God keeps his promises. Mission accomplished. So what was impossible, Christ made possible and now it is finished. It's accomplished. Easy peasy, right? Mm, Well, Are you familiar with the term imposter syndrome? It's a feeling that you don't really belong somewhere. As an example, someone might 
apply for and get a job that they don't really feel qualified for. And so after that, you have this feeling all the time that you're not really supposed to be there. And you fear that one day everybody's going to discover that you don't belong there and you'll be found out. And so you keep your head down. You, know, you don't volunteer for anything. You just try to avoid being noticed because you don't want to be discovered. The same thing can happen to believers in God's house. The deceiver that lying liar who lies can whisper into your ear that you're not qualified to be here. That a sinner like you doesn't deserve to be here. That you've blown it and one day you're going to be discovered. One of Satan's vile tactics is to isolate you and lead you to believe that you're the only one. That everyone else deserves to be here except for you. Hey, I've got good news for you. None of us deserve to be here. Not one. None of us are qualified. But God, in His infinite mercy, provided a way. Jesus issued us an invitation. He paid our way by His single sacrifice once for all time. He qualifies us. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. There's nothing I can do to improve upon it. I'm here because I was invited. Christ has redeemed me. I belong. Turn and look at somebody near you and just go... You belong. You belong. Not because anything we have done, but because what Christ has accomplished. Look, uh, two more quick things I want to mention uh, before we go. Look at verses 24 and 25. This is in chapter 10. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I can think of no better reason to encourage you to get into one of our connect groups, one of our Sunday school classes, if you're not already, and to participate regularly because we are all susceptible to the mistaken belief that we don't belong, that we're not good enough, that we alone are the imposter. Did you know that's why scripture encourages us to confess our sins one to another? Not because we need to hear all your dirty laundry. We don't, we don't want to hear all the gory details. But we do need to be reminded that we all struggle with temptations and challenges in this dark world. Because the deceiver wants you to believe that you're all alone. That's why you need to be in a small trusted group of believers who can encourage one another. Don't become isolated and vulnerable to the deceiver's lies. You know, in the African plains... When the lions go hunting for prey, they find a way to isolate their prey because they know if they can isolate them, they can devour them. 1 Peter 5 eight says, He prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Listen, don't allow yourself to become isolated. Let me tell you something about you. You need community. You need to be able to share your struggles of faith, of daily life, with those who care for you and love you and who are also undergoing those struggles. Don't become isolated. And last, as you've seen elsewhere in Hebrews, the author, speaking to his audience of Jewish believers, issues a stern warning that if you're not careful can be very scary to read. Let me close with verses 26 and 27. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there's no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. There's only the terrible expectation of God's judgment and the raging fire that will consume His enemies. Let me tell you something about that passage. This is not referring to believers who still struggle with sin. This refers to apostasy. These are people who made professions of faith in Jesus Christ, but never genuinely received Him as Savior. It is profession without possession. They were pretenders. Those who turn away from Christ never really trusted Him to begin with. 1 John 2, 19 says, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. If you want to hear somebody who can tell you about the struggle of sin that a believer faces, you listen to Paul in Romans 7. He talks about the human struggle we all experience with sin. He knew that even those with God's Spirit still had human nature and will have to continue to resist that selfish pull of the flesh while we seek to obey. He summed up his struggle in Romans 7, verses 22 through 24, where he writes, I love God's law with all my heart. 
But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. And this power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And he answers us. He answers that question in verse 25. Thanks be to God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is, he says, in my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. And then in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 8, he says, there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. All believers will struggle with temptation to sin throughout their lifetimes. But here's some good news for you if you struggle with this stern warning in Hebrews. You see, if you struggle with sin, that's a good sign that what Hebrews 10, 16 tells us is actually at work. That's where the Lord said, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and I will write them on their mind. So if your heart is troubled when you fall into sin, this warning in Hebrews 10, 26, that's not describing you. Your conscience, remember, it serves as a reminder of your sin to, to cause you to draw close to the Father. Christ has already paid the price. He's redeemed your sin. He's paid the price. So now we can confidently approach the Father repentant and receive the forgiveness Christ has already purchased once for all time with His perfect sacrifice. That's all by God's perfect design. Remember in 1016, we read, this is the new covenant, he says, that I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their hearts and I'll write them on their minds. The Lord provided in your heart a way to keep bringing you back to him. And he did that for his people. If you weren't his, you wouldn't struggle. Only those who have abandoned faith in Christ's sacrifice for sin don't struggle with sin. A good friend of ours in a Sunday school class we were in in Arlington said it like this. I still sin, but my rebound time is getting shorter and shorter. Because God is at work within you to sanctify you and make you holy. Listen, the Lord has written His laws on your heart. You're His. He will accomplish in you what He started. So, yes... Heed the warning to persevere, but don't fear that you have lost what cannot be lost. Remember, our confidence is in Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who has accomplished the mission the Father sent him to accomplish. And now we find ourselves in this daily struggle to follow Christ. That's why we're reading together in Dwell. Look, if I told you that you needed to walk down the dangerous trail that drops off the rim down into the Grand Canyon, 6,000 feet down steeply winding and treacherous terrain at night. If I gave you that task, what's one item you would want to be certain that you took with you? If you're Tom Cruise, it would be a motorcycle and a parachute, but we're not Tom Cruise. For most of us, it is a flashlight. Of course, you'd want the most powerful flashlight you could find. And that's what dwell is for us. Listen, we're living in dark times. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. Every single day you are walking a treacherous path down a dangerous journey. And you need all the light you can have every day. There's no doubt that you need the brightest light you can possibly have. So to summarize, what was impossible, Christ has made possible and has once for all time secured our redemption with his perfect sacrifice so we can draw near to God with confidence to tell us die. It is finished. Mission accomplished. You guys remember the old hymn, I know whom I have believed. You have to say it like, believe it. I know whom I have believed it. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. That, that is confidence in the one who could do what we could not do.
he is able. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you love us so, that you prepared a way for us to be in your presence. In spite of our sin, you have covered our sin with the blood of the spotless, unblemished Lamb of God. And because of what has been accomplished, we may enter into your presence. Father, thank you for cleansing that you knew we needed. Now, Father, help us to with confidence draw near and let you continue to make us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.